Well, we seemingly are one day closer to being together, if it be the Lord's will. It's interesting how many lessons have been preached on this pandemic. I've heard many of them. And they have to deal with um, questions like, did God send it? To what degree did he send it? Is it coming mainly through his providence? Did he not send it at all? Is he uh, merely using a circumstance that came by chance to teach us lessons? Well, what else interests me about these lessons is the fact that uh, the speaker is implying to his unassuming audience that he knows. I want to suggest to you this morning that all of these options are on the table and none of us knows the detail, the origin of this or exactly how God is using it as it pertains to the detail. But we know, however it came, we do understand the lessons that God wants us to derive from it because these lessons are seen in his word. Uh, all these options are a possibility, but we do know that God cares. We do know that God controls. We do know that God uses it all for faithful Christians to their betterment. We know all of that for sure, even if we don't know all the detail. Your life is brief. That is a message, a clear message from God's word. It's like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. That's a lesson that we learn from this pandemic, even if we don't understand all of the detail. Our life is brief. We understand that our priorities are not God's priorities. Haven't we learned this lesson during this time of isolation? That we need to depend upon God. He alone is the source of true fulfillment. He alone is the reason we can rejoice always. And, and, and again, we say rejoice. As we've studied in the book of Philippians, we know that money and, uh, and vacation and hobbies and sports, they are not the source of fulfillment, only temporarily from a physical standpoint. God is that ultimate source, but he is testing us. He's testing us as to whether we will be the people that he wants us to be, of faith, of not knowing all the details, yet faithfully following him, like Job, like Paul, like all of the faithful in the word of God. Will we be these people of faith? You know, we've heard all of our lives, God is in control. Worldly possessions really don't mean much. And we say those things very well, but it's in times like these where our faith is tested to see if we truly mean them or not. We have a unique window here to really be people of generosity, to be people who care, to live like our Lord, to be more dedicated to prayer. I hope you've used this time for these ends. This is what we know God's will is for us during this time. Have we become people more committed to studying his word? or more committed to phone evangelism. You know, we should be used to be talking on the phone by now. Will our priorities be God's priorities from now on? Will this become our new normal? You know, someone has well stated that character is mainly seen when we're alone. How we think when we're alone. How we act when we're alone. An extended period of isolation. Interesting. So interesting. We've said these things all of our lives. Now we know. Now, since our faith has been tested, we know if we've passed the test. You know, the way the world has reacted in fear, in trepidation, not knowing, uh, faith not being hardly a part, if at all, uh, a part of their lives during this time. How have we reacted? Have we shared in their dismay? Have we shared in what perhaps they have lost physically? Or have we brought them closer to God? Have we taken the lead? You know, as we studied the book of Philippians on Wednesday night, Paul was in prison, but you know, spiritually, he still took the lead. 
He was generous. He was worried about everybody else. He was thanking the Philippians. He said, yeah, it's my will that I get out of here. But you know what? If it's the Lord's will that I stay in isolation for a while longer, that's where I'll be. But I'm still going to take the lead spiritually, faithfully. That should be our prayer. And as we begin this lesson, why don't we go to God in prayer now for those very things? And perhaps during this time of isolation, you've been able to grow spiritually and in intense prayer, in supplication. So perhaps as we say this prayer, maybe that you want to get on your knees as we pray. You know, I remember as a little child, I remember some of the men would, would actually kneel when it was time to pray. They, they, they'd step out into the aisle and they would kneel, or, or the ones up behind the pulpit that were leading in the service, they would kneel. Haven't seen that in years. Maybe that's another thing we can learn from this pandemic. So if you want to kneel during this prayer, feel free to do that. Prayer posture is not uh, mandatory in scripture by any means, but perhaps this is just another one of many lessons that we can learn. So let's pray together. Our Father in God, we are so thankful for our lot in life. We're thankful for our situation in life. And at times it might not be exactly as we would want, but Father, allow us, like the Apostle Paul, in whatever state we're in to be content, knowing that external circumstances don't uh, fulfill joy, but you and you alone. Father, if there are any hurting from, from our congregation suffering, we pray uh, a special blessing upon them. And Father, we pray that you would use us as instruments in your hands to see to those needs. And Father, if it be your will, bring us back together very soon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A young boy leans down and looks into the creek, almost as if he were trying to see his reflection in the water below. But this boy is not trying to see his reflection. If he did, he would see a handsome, ruddy, uh, boy that was prepared for the Israelite maidens. But he's not looking at his reflection. This boy is looking for something else. He's looking for five stones. And not just five stones, five smooth stones that would fit well into a sling. And we need to understand, unlike the song that our children sing in Vacation Bible School, David didn't take five small stones, five little stones. And they weren't flat either. Sometimes we have the mind that these stones you could throw and they were so flat they could skip across the water. No. These stones might have been small compared to a basketball, but these stones were about the size of a baseball, a tennis ball at the very least. And these stones would have fit very well into a sling back in the times of David and Israel. In fact, this sling would not be like a slingshot that we know today. This sling would be quite long and it would be able to be slung at quite a revolution. In fact, uh, a sling back in these days were a primary weapon to be used against one's enemies. They could, they could travel long distances at 80 miles an hour, and there were those in Israel, remember in Judges chapter 20, there were 700 slingers, left-handed slingers, by the way, who could hit a hair and not miss. Not only were there sweet singers of Israel, like David, but there were sweet slingers of Israel and how sweet they were. And David was one of these, interestingly enough. These stones were like a big revolutionary war slug. They were round. And boy, if one of these stones could hit somebody in the forehead, it could do a lot of damage. In fact, it could kill you easily. 
Well, David went to meet a giant. As you know, this giant was nine feet, nine inches tall. And he wore armor, but the armor of that day was not made of metal. It was leather. Armor made of leather. And this King Kong of a man says in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and at verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, he's been saying this, Goliath has been saying this for 40 days and no one has shown up until today. Today, someone is going to take that challenge. David, you know what he was doing when he heard the challenge? He was delivering cheese and crackers to his brothers in the fight against the Philistines. Actually, the Bible says cheese and bread, but cracker, bread. That's what David was doing. And he was tending sheep. He was not a warrior, but he did things in his past life that would enable him to be a warrior like kill a lion and a bear. Being able to sling a rock to daze the lion and the bear and then to be able to save the prey from the jaws of the animal. You know, all that we have to do in our past life, if we will commit our lives to God, will help us in the future. Well, when David heard the taunting of Goliath, notice what David says beginning in verse 40. The Bible says that David took his staff in his hands and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Oh, and you can just hear Goliath as he mocks when he sees little David coming against what scripture calls Goliath the champion, the champion of all the giants. I mean, if there was an, ever an, a classic example of uh, big and small, it was David and Goliath. And even in the minds of non-religious people, they know that example between big and little. David and Goliath. And here, no doubt, Goliath is mocking. Look in verse 41. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. Here comes the great confrontation. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He couldn't stand the fact that uh, there was no one in his caliber to meet this kind of uh, a competi uh, competition. The giant says, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. You know, it reminds me uh, in, in high school, you know, on the football team, when the big uh, ogre linemen want to hit the uh, pretty little boy running back. That's what this reminds me of. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? I guess you could say Goliath called him Twiggy. How could you send this man? How can, what is this? What are you doing? Well, what are the odds now at this point? Pretend that you don't know the end of the story. What odds are you giving David now to defeat Goliath? What would those odds be? Not, not very large, I, I guess. What odds do you give a faithful Christian against sin today? What odds do you give God's people against the virus today? Or anything that might be viewed as an impediment to God? You know, some people say, I'm already whipped. I'm already beaten. But you know, all the examples we have in the Bible, whether it's Abraham or Moses or Elijah or David or 
or uh, Paul or Peter or Jesus. They never quit. They never say, hey, the odds are too big. Now, the 10 spies who went to spy out the promised land would say that. When they saw their giants, all were but grasshoppers in their sight. Uh, Joshua and Caleb wouldn't say that. And I hope that you and I won't say that today, no matter what the situation is. Even though the enemy mocks, even though Satan mocks, and Satan many times uses other people to do that mocking for him. But here's Goliath, and you can almost see skinny, scrawny David against big, brutish, bulky Goliath. Whose side are you on? Most people pick the side of the giant, even today. You know, the fear of our giant today didn't come from a boast. In fact, it came very quietly. It came from China, and it caused businesses and churches and places of recreation to close almost instantaneously. It's kept families apart. It has caused death in some cases. We know how this enemy stirs fear. We even meet our enemy today with our armor, right? Have you been wearing your mask out in public? But do we know really how to face the enemy? I'm not saying all the... All the uh, governmental regulations in terms of hygiene that have been suggested to us. I mean, do we know how to face this virus, this giant, all of our giants from a spiritual standpoint? Do we know how to react? Do we know how to take the lead? Do we know how to express our faith in God during these times? Do we know how to face the enemy? The God who helped David with Goliath helps us. Do you believe that? All we need, like David, is five stones. Do you ever wonder why David chose five stones? I've heard a lot of commenting about that. But why, why do you think he selected five? You know, in 2 Samuel 21, David had four brothers. Now, the, uh, some translations might indicate that he had a brother who had three sons. But either way you read that, there was Goliath and either his four sons or his brother and three sons, five, totaling five. I wonder if David thought that maybe after Goliath, he might have to take care of business elsewhere. I don't know, just, just a thought. I don't think that David thought that he might miss four times. I, I don't really get that impression. Or I wonder if David knew my lesson this morning and he knew it would... No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, I want us to look at the five stones that David used. And I want us to use those stones as we face our impediments to either heaven or a faithful life in Christ. You know, these giants were so big. In fact, uh, Goliath had uh, one of his brothers. You know, he was so big that he had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. There was so much space there, God had to give him an extra digit. But you know, that still didn't matter in this spiritual battle of Armageddon that we're facing today. The God that brought down Goliath is the God that will bring down all of our fears and all of our giants. But the first stone that David used was the stone of the past. The stone of the past. When everyone else saw Goliath, they feared, didn't they? Everybody. Nobody would meet the challenge that Goliath was extending for 40 days until David. Why is that? Did they not have a past upon which they could calculate the strength of God? No, but David had that, that, had that uh, past. 
And I know that in the Bible, there's a part of our past that we're not to look back. In fact, again, in the book of Philippians that we've studied on Wednesday night, uh, Paul says, this one thing I do, not looking backward, but looking forward to the prize of the high calling uh, uh, in Christ Jesus, my Lord. But you know, there is a healthy look at the past as well in seeing victories that we've won before and how God has seen us through. And David knew, hey, I didn't kill that bear and lion all by myself. I know who was with me during that time and I know who's with me now. We are to forget the past. We're to forget those sins. We're to forget being held responsible for those sins. God has restored the joy of our salvation to us as we have put those things away. But God still, through his word, wants us to remember things. We are to remember his steadfastness, his glory, his strength. Do you remember some of the things of the past, even from a physical nature? Do you remember the plagues of the past, the bubonic plague? Remember the flus of the past? Remember all of those and the fear they generated? Life has gone on. Do you remember 9-11? Do you remember the Titans? Or perhaps do you remember the Alamo? There is something to be said for remembering. Peter said that he wanted to stir up the brethren's pure minds by way of remembrance. You know, there's something powerful in the Lord's Supper as we, uh, every first day of the week, engage in that memory, in that memorial, in that remembrance. You know, God has made proverbial roadkill out of a lot of enemies. And he promises to do that in our lives. You know, someone has said, a good memory makes a good hero. Because a hero truly remembers the humility of the past, the victories of the past. It wasn't, uh, uh, it, it wasn't that person alone that got them to the place where they are, uh, to hero status you see? And faithful people, people of integrity, will give others credit for helping in that journey. But it won't lead to fear. What has God done for you in the past? Think of all of the provision. Think of all the victories. Glory be to God the fact that we are here in the, in the situation we find ourselves. That is the message that we portray, not a spirit of fear or timidity. God has given us a spirit, a passion of strength and power. Not in physical things, but spiritually speaking. Someone has also said, etch your worries in sand, but etch your victories in stone. And never forget them. But not only did David have the stone of the past, he had the stone of prayer. You know, when we pray, we humble ourselves. We get down low in order for our request to be made high. So I guess that's why most prayer posture is on one's knees or with his face down or with his, uh, he has a contrite physical presence as well as an internal presence. But David took the stone of prayer. He spoke to God often. You know, Abraham Lincoln, uh, who probably was the first most hated president, said this, I was driven to my knees because that's the only place I had to go. That was loneliness. That was a manifestation of hate from a lot of people. I'm glad we have the National Day of Prayer today on May 7th. And even though uh, it is attempted by the government to get people to focus on prayer that one day, 
Every day is the Christian's day of prayer. And David understood that, a great man of prayer. But he understood that in order to be exalted, he had to go to the lowest part of the valley. I wonder if we understand that. Jesus understood in order to be given glory, dominion, and kingdom, he had to go to the cross. Abraham understood as time went on, if he was going to be the father of the faithful, he had to offer his only son. And so it is with every instance of these faithful people of God. You've got to go to the valley first. And we have to go to the valley of prayer. But notice here in the account of David and Goliath at this point, everyone is higher than David. David is just the lowly shepherd boy. He's the youngest of his brothers. His brothers are higher than him. Saul, King Saul is higher than him. Goliath is much higher than him. He's the lowest of everybody. But he understands to whip his giant, he has to have the stone of the past and now the stone of prayer. You know, Israel, before this time, were slaves. No matter where we see God's people, why is it they're always the lowest of the low first? Why did Jesus empty himself and identify being the highest of the high, God? Now he comes and he's born on this earth and he's the lowest of the low. In his birth, in his life, in his death. Everything. Why? Is there a lesson in this? Why have we been brought low because of our acceptance of sin? Or maybe not have anything to do with sin, a giant that crops up. And we have to humble ourselves. Interesting, isn't it? He took the stone of prayer. But in the third case, the third stone that David took, he took the stone of priority. Look in chapter 17, beginning at verse 25. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. The men of Israel are speaking of Goliath. And it shall be that the man who kills him, watch this, the king, not God, the king will enrich with great physical possessions, with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes of Israel. You see, this is what everyone else was focused on. They were focused on the physical, 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 worldly, worldly, worldly. Look how big the giant is. If someone does happen to beat him, look at all the physical blessings they'll receive. And you know, those of us in God's kingdom today have that same mindset and we need to get out of it. And many of us have it. We're focused on the temporal continually. You hear it in speech, you hear it in action. David wasn't, David was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't like that. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him, watch this, saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Well, David just heard what was done. David was trying to rebut what was said. That's not where the emphasis should lie. That's not the most important thing. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies, watch this, of the living God? Who is it among us today who will defy the army of the living God, the church of Jesus Christ, or who will defy Christians and, their, and thereby defying God by saying that any sin, that any impediment that gets in our way is more important than the one who can save us from us in the, uh, save us from it in the snap of a finger. Who is that man? That man needs to repent. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be. These physical things shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his older brother, David's older brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You little peon should be tacked on as a parenthetical statement here. 
I know your pride. I know your heart. Oh my goodness, Eliab, you, you better be careful. You're speaking to a man after God's own heart. For you have just come down to see the battle. You left the sheep up there, probably unattended. You've come down just to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? And he asked this question. Is there not a cause? Does God not have his will? Doesn't he want one person who has any lick of spirituality at all to stand up and say, you're not going to defy the God of Israel anymore. I'm not going to partake in your woe is me mentality that we can't whip our giants, that we can't glorify God, even when the uh, odds seem insurmountable. Is there not a cause when we think of what's going on around us and we look out our windows and see our lost neighbor, is there not a cause? When we look and see our brother falling deeper and deeper, is there not a cause? Yes, there may be a physical cause out there, but it can't stop there. And that's the point that David is saying. Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Wow. Wow. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. They were going to go tell. And he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against uh, this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth. And he is a man of war. He has experience. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Here's the stone of the past. And he utilized the stone of prayer. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Same God that helped me there. God's going to deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Well, the stone, this third stone of priority, David doesn't talk about anyone else. I've counted nine times in this text. David mentions God only two times. He mentions Goliath, and it was not in political terms at all. But everybody else didn't mention God once, and all they can talk about is the giant. Is there a lesson there? Is there a lesson as we apply that to the virus or anything else in our lives that's of a detrimental nature to us? How many times do you focus on your trouble than God? How many times have you talked about the virus during this period of isolation than you have God? If that's not, if that's not the interpretation and the application of this, of this, uh, account of David and Goliath. I don't know what is. You know, some thoughts need to be interu interrupted when we talk about priority. You know, David was a shepherd boy. You know, he wrote a lot of psalms, a lot of songs. So he was continually putting words in his mind about how good and how strength, how strong, how merciful God is. You know, when we do that, when we do that in worship, when we do that in home worship, when we do that in our Bible study, and we keep hearing those words and putting those words into our minds, you see, that's how priority is established. You have words, you have ears, the words go through the ears, then they go into our mind, and then it's in the mind where they need, some need to stay there, and some need to be filtered out. And then from the mind, what we allow to stay there go, go, will go into our hearts, and then what's in our hearts, that's who we are. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Well, are you a spiritual warrior or are you a wimp? You can tell by what you allow to stay in your mind and what you kick out. David was a man after God's own heart because he wrote Psalms, because he understood what needed to stay there and what needed to be kicked out. Almost everyone else in Israel didn't have that priority stone, if you will, as a part of them. So when it came time to either fear or step up, they ran. They ran, but not David, not David at all. You know, someday you're going to worry about health. 
Someday you're going to worry about death. And it all depends on what you've put in your mind during your life, how you're going to face that moment, how you're going to face your giant. Are you ready to go? But not only that, the fourth stone that David took was the stone of passion. You know, his brothers and Saul and Goliath, they were all laughing at David. They were all having a good time at, 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 at making a joke of David. And no doubt you can almost see Goliath laughing as he pulls his head back to chuckle. And perhaps David saw an opening, maybe right about here. Who knows? I added that to the story. But anyway, David saw an opening and David spotted that target. So he takes one of those smooth, round, baseball-like stones and he puts it in his sling and he begins to twirl. And he lets that stone go across the valley of Elah and it is making its way no doubt over 70, 80 miles per hour. And it's headed right for that giant and it hits him right in the forehead. And no doubt Goliath's eyes cross and his knees buckle and he hits the ground. And so David then runs with this four stone of passion, not only to get to the battlefield, but to claim the victory as God has empowered him. So he runs up to the giant and he takes Goliath's sword out of his own sheath. And he decapitates the giant. Wow. You might say that David knew how to get ahead of his giant. You miss that, don't you? You know, I miss uh, the rolling of the eyes and the moans as well. You know, I don't get that from a camera, so I'm looking forward to uh, seeing and hearing that very shortly. But I want to ask you this question. As you have this stone of passion in your life, do you run toward your giant? Do you meet your giant head on? Or do you feel like you're well armed with the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6? David felt well equipped. He knew who was on his side. But lastly, David took the stone of persistence. He kept on. He kept on praying. He kept on working even earlier in his life to prepare him for this day. Persistence. We think of the persistent widow. We think of continuing to fight the great fight daily. There is the stone of persistence. And David had it and you and I need to have it in our lives. You know, a lot of times one prayer won't be enough. One uh, victory in one battle won't be enough. We have to continue to be the soldier that God wants us to be. You know, Jesus was tempted and he fasted for 40 days to get him in his weakest spot to, to show that God can help us even in our weakest. He'll never allow us to get to the end of our rope. He will do this. But you know, as we think of these five stones that David chose and how they can apply to our lives, I also think of five other stones that can lead to salvation, and that's hearing Believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Those five stepping stones, if you will, will lead to salvation as well. And maybe there, there is someone that needs to obey the gospel. You have the opportunity to do that. I hope you'll let me know if you have that uh, need and we can take care of that. Or if you have need to be restored, perhaps that you haven't faced your giants like David did. Perhaps there are things in your life that have... Uh, won the battle of the day and you want to be the victor and you want to take the sword and you want to kill those things. You have the opportunity to do that uh, today as well and every day. We're glad that you uh, tuned in this morning. We hope that your worship is done in spirit and truth and we look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Good morning, church. The eldership wants you to know that we're thinking about you. We love you and we pray for you often. We also want to let you know that we are looking forward to the time we can be together face-to-face -face for corporate worship, hopefully sooner rather than later. In these uh, uncertain times, it's good to remember the Lord's Word and the comfort that we find there. 
In Isaiah 41, verse 10, we read, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, thank you for the blessings of life. Thank you for allowing us to be your children. And thank you for holding us, Lord, in your right hand. Sometimes we don't realize everything that you do for us, Lord, and we pray that you will help us to realize that and learn to depend on you even more. Help us to find true joy in you, Lord, and be with us in, the, in our church family. And bless us as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.